Hello, and welcome to this research conversation episode of Change Starts Here. I'm Kim Yaris, and I am joined by my friends and colleagues, Drs. Eve Miller and Jennifer Chevalier. And here we are. It's January. It's <laughs> New Year's. And possibly some of you out there are already feeling like a failure. You set a goal and you've not accomplished it. Um, which brings us to today's topic, which is all about self-discipline. But there's good news, y'all, because we've got some new science that will flip a lot of what we know about self-discipline on its head. There are definitely some like held beliefs about self-discipline. For me, self-discipline is like holding myself accountable for things that I've committed to or that I feel are my responsibility. And so there's like some guilt around that or shame if I get off track. Um, what about you, Eve? I think when I think about self-discipline, yes, I, someone, I think Kim, you just said the word shame. I think there is a lot of shame associated with it. Um, and I think what comes to my mind, like the visuals that come to my mind are like, people in the military and the armed services who have that training, right? Like, and they make their bed very clean and they are very strong because they're always able to get to the gym and they're always able to do all these things. So I think that's what comes to my mind. So uh, props to our, um, to all of the people in the military past and present. <laughs> so, And I get it because like this word self-discipline, it's like, I feel it in my body and it's not a good feeling, right? It's a, tension in my jaw or a tightness in my muscles. Mm. Um, you know, it's almost like this feeling of rigidity, like I got to get down to business. <laughs> I got things to do and I got to get through it. That's how it feels to me. Um, so we're casting self-discipline in a pretty negative light, but it's interesting that those are just our off the cuff feelings about it and like what comes on us when we think about it. So I can't wait to hear the new science. Um, before we dive into that though, I just want to um, talk about with our student leadership portrait, how we define um, self-discipline, which is the ability to stay focused and do what needs to be done, even when it's challenging. <laughs> yeah, no, I was not expecting to have that negative of reaction, but really I heard that word shame and to what you're saying, Kim, like that, like, Oh, I have to overcome. And, you know, you're sharing the definition, Jennifer, and we built that definition for the student leadership portrait from, you know, research from our, from other models um, out there uh, around workforce readiness around, um, 21st century skills. So this is like a common understanding of self-discipline um, is that. And, you know, when I think about things that aren't working well, you know, for everyone, I think what goes wrong? And when I dove into self-discipline to understand where we're at with the research on it and what gets in the way, I found some absolutely fascinating research that is once again i try and look for the most recent but this is like just been coming out over the past few years um as we develop our tools for looking at the brain and understanding the connection between brain and behavior that's why so many of these things i talk about i'm like this is just coming out because our technology to do this is getting stronger and stronger by leaps and bounds every single year, maybe every single month. I don't know, but it's just, we're getting insight into being human and how to be better at humaning. <laughs> um, right. all Can I just pop in here yeah. for a second? Because, you know, now I cannot profess to speak for all of the listening body out there, but I <laughs> safe to say that we're like, please tell us, please tell us, because especially now at the beginning of the new year, we're envisioning how we want this year to go and focus on our goals. I know for one, I would like not to be so rigid and stressed and tensed and, you know, you know, not have lockjaw because <laughs> I want to achieve my goals. Oh, totally. And, you know, we're at the place where 
what what has research shown like there's like a certain date where over 50 percent of people have uh they've already like given up on their uh new year's goals if they even set them and fewer and fewer people set them every year i think it is this relationship so i hear you like i am so excited about it, but I'm also preambling. So <laughs> let's talk about self-discipline, um, just some basics around it. And then I'm going to bring in the, the, the neuroscience, what we're learning about the brain and behavior um, that is really kind of shifting everything. So just to get a foundational understanding of where science has been before this time, we are, we've learned that self-discipline is what we call a diminishing resource. So the idea is we have only so much of it. And the more that we use self-discipline, like in a day, the less of it we have. That's really important to this conversation. And so wait, can I ask self- a clarifying question about that, oh. Eve? So uh, yeah. like, I think I've, I know the term a limited resource, like time is a limited resource. And so when we use that, there's still a set amount of time in a day. We're just using part of it. But you're saying with self-discipline, it's a diminishing resource. So the more you use of it, the less you can access later. Did I understand that right? I think calling it a limited resource, um, like similar to time is, it's actually a great analogy because every day we start over with a full 24 hours, um, just as, you know, assuming a healthy diet, you've got enough sleep and stuff like the, it's this brain food and self-discipline requires a lot of energy, a lot of brain food. And we only have so much of that because our brain is always trying to protect itself, right? Our body's trying to protect itself. Anyway, that's another story, but yes, it's a limited resource because of the limitations of our brain. Um, Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and and it makes me think about kind of this other piece of it that's foundational. And that is, okay, so what are some of the things that we have learned that really deplete self-discipline? Um, two of them uh, will not be all that surprising. Uh, so we know that emotion regulation. So the idea of needing to suppress or regulate emotions it can consume a significant amount of self-discipline. So if you're in situations, I mean, if you think about really negative work environments, um, hopefully no one has had one of those before, but if you, (laughs) I think we actually can all relate to that or maybe a home environment or different environments that we're in that are really negative, that like that, it depletes our like those resources that we need to exert self-discipline. If you think about that in like a classroom setting, right? Also, um, if a student is having to exert a lot of emotion regulation, it's depleting their ability to actually show a discipline controlled self. Could I just jump in here? So I'm just thinking about my former students and um, conversations that I've had with other colleagues. And I think that sometimes students get criticized for being lazy, um, you know, so it, it that it, which to me is sort of a, a criticism of their discipline, you know, their inability to complete the tasks at hand. And so what I hear you saying is that, you know, before we jump to that confu- conclusion, maybe we need to look at what's going on with them emotionally. What kind of stress might they be under that is interfering or depleting their ability to get to that end goal, whatever that may be? Yeah, no, I think that's such a great observation. And I agree with that. I think there's all sorts of factors in a home life, maybe factors in a school you know, they might walk into a classroom and be depleted already because they needed to, I mean, because the second one very related to emotional regulation is stress that you, you touch on. And so stress is very related, of course, to emotions and emotion regulation, but it is, there might have been so much stress in a home environment or in a community, in the school around them, that they are just depleted. And one very, very normal reaction for feeling overwhelmed by stress is to shut down. So I agree with you. I also think to the topic of discipline, 
It's laziness around a goal that we believe is important for them often. Like as a parent of a teenager who committed to recognizing the beauty in adolescence and learning the brain science behind what is actually happening in there. Where did my baby go? Um, I, I think that there's a perspective I bring of how I was taught to discipline and how I saw lazy as a kid. And when I was called unmotivated, you know, those labels we get put on us, it was tied to very adult centered goals. And it didn't keep in mind, it lacks an awareness of what's actually important to that, to the student or to the child. Right. So I think you're helping really me think of a paradigm shift I had early on in my teaching experience where I grew up with a lot of family support. And so as a kid, like I always had my homework done and it was done to the best of my ability, um, you know, and it was polished and it was everything a teacher would dream of. Right. And then I became a teacher and some kids, their homework was halfway done or there was no homework or it was crumpled in the bottom of the backpack, completely untouched, or it was left at home or their dog ate it. And, um, I would get really frustrated. Like, how are you going to really get these skills down in math if you're not practicing them when you get home? And as I learned about a student's um, family life and background, my second year of teaching, I totally shifted how I thought about that because that was something I was putting as a priority on this child's life. But really the fact that this child came to school was a miracle. Um, and so I shifted from being upset that the homework wasn't done to just expressing how like grateful and glad I was that the student had come to school that day because I had a totally different perspective of the stress and the emotions that were happening before coming to school. And that I think is why shifting how we think about self-discipline is with this new science is really it gives hope because I am certain you were a fantastic teacher. I know that. And I am certain you still saw that student for their worth and potential and so gave them rigorous work and all of that. But I think it's very easy to, to kind of write that student off or give them an easy pass because you know what they're going through. Um, while also, you know, if they are behaving very poorly, it is very difficult to always remind yourself like, Oh, they're really struggling at home. It's fine, right? Like, I mean, that's also taking a lot of taxing um, uh, your emotion regulation and your stress levels. Um, so I think it's a great segue to talk about what the neuroscience is saying. And let's bring it back to this example in a moment. Um, so the long and short of it is there's a brain area that we are now learning is most active when a person is exerting like self-control or like discipline is in a dis like self-discipline state. And that is a place in the brain. We're learning this from EEG. Um, so that's where you get the little electrodes on your, on your scalp and it looks so cute. Um, uh, you know, different, different preferences, I guess. Uh, so, <laughs> so what we are learning from that research is there's this area of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. And it is that really active region. And this is a brain region I actually have studied a lot in the past. Um, and it's a really interesting area because it's responsible for internal conflict monitoring and like the management of conflict. And when they found this, that self-discipline was related to this ACC or the anterior cingulate cortex, which it sits, by the way, for those who are interested in this, it, it sits, it's, it's a C shape and it sits between your emotion centers of your brain and between your frontal lobe. So it's kind of the relay station between those two. So it has a really important role in higher order thinking and emotion management, as you might imagine. So knowing that this is where they were seeing discipline, the researchers are like, what in the world? Like, it shouldn't be more in the frontal lobe. Like, it's this higher order thing. But looking at there as an internal conflict, 
they started looking at the nature of what self-discipline really is. And this is kind of the short of it. It is self-discipline is the monitoring and management of internal conflict. So here's, let's take, you know, one of the, the basic examples. And I think it'll make more sense what I mean by that. So um, like you get home, you're depleted, you are stressed out and you're just thinking, oh man, I want to eat that lasagna that my sister brought over. And is it, oh no, I probably should. Oh no. I, I said I'd eat a salad every day in January or whatever these, you know, new year's goals are like I'm eating more. And that is a conflict in your head. It is a conflict between the person you think you should be and the person who you like, there's like this more automatic response, like your body's craving carbs to like compensate for stress, right? Or whatever that is. Or some of the like examples of, I don't whether it's scrolling late at night through your phone, you know, there's this conflict and self-discipline as we know it is the battle between like, oh, I should get off my phone. Oh, but I really just need a little downtime. I'm just going to look at a couple more things. Oh, I really should eat that salad. Oh, you know, I really, really want that pizza, right? So it's a conflict that we have internally that is actually what we currently think when we talk about and activate self-discipline, that is actually what is happening. I'm understanding you correctly. Um, what I hear you saying is what I used to do when I went for the cookie at the end of a long day was just say, say to myself, what would then, what would then happen is I'm so undisciplined. I, you know, you know, you know, I am just so bad at sticking to my goals and you know, it goes back to that shame that we talked to and talked about at the beginning. Whereas based upon what I hear you now is saying about the brain research is what I really needed to say is you must have been working really hard all day to keep it together, you know? Um, and that just feels so much kinder to myself, you know, to recognize my humanity um, rather than um, kind of beat myself up for my shortcomings to hold it all together, right? So it helps me to understand why I ate the cookie and why I couldn't not eat the apple instead or couldn't eat the apple instead. Yeah, well, I mean, if you don't mind us skipping ahead just a little, I, what you're speaking to is so important because it is it is how we actually exert more of what we, the output that we call self-discipline in a person's life when we observe others, how we actually get to that place. One of the steps is what you were speaking to. It is acknowledging ourselves. So if you think about it, I mean, I was just perusing through like YouTube videos and through blog articles and things like that in preparation for this, just to see is this still a, a pervasive belief that like self-discipline is like how I still think of it, like that really tough thing? It absolutely is. It is overcoming the self, like, it, like just denying the self, like that old lazy self. So you can become this new, amazing self. It's, it's filled with self-hate. It's filled with a lack of self-compassion. And the way, the path to actually reaching goals, the discipline to reach goals and do that running that you want to do every five days a week or whatever is starts by re-engaging with awareness of emotions and just your, how you are doing your perception because disconnecting from that as we often can do when we're trying to push ourselves forward is it disconnects us from the most wise parts of ourselves and the parts of ourselves that actually get out of bed in the morning, the parts of ourselves that can show the compassion and allow emotions to not control us 
because emotions don't go away. We have a stressful day. We can't hate ourselves out of that stress. So hold on. So I have to ask a question here because I feel like I totally hear you and I'm not real great at self-compassion. That's not one of my superpowers. Let's just put that out there now. But like, it seems like it'd be a really slippery slope if I have a goal and we've been using like food or exercise. So let's say I'm working out in my gym four days a week and one night I don't feel like it. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have self-compassion. I'm just going to sit here on the couch and binge watch some shows. Like mm. suddenly that could turn into a very slippery slope where that goal is completely gone. So how do you have moments of self-compassion, but stay on the track toward the goal? Right. Well, I think, you are in that paradigm of self-control and same as me, like this is knowing this science is going to take me a long time to dismantle how I think about it. Just to be clear, it's still in that paradigm where self-control is a matter of willpower and I can will myself to go do things I don't want to do. But remember back to the beginning, self-control, diminishing resource, limited resource. We only have so much of it. And so we have to find ways to do what we call self-control without needing to willpower ourselves to do it. So by having an internal conflict where we're shaming ourselves as we sit there and watch the, the, house, the housewives or whatever, you know, like that only depletes us more. That only, that does nothing to help us pursue the goal better tomorrow. And so I know I'm leaving you hanging on like what instead it is where we need to actually shift to go after it. It's actually kind of the lack of willpower is what we should be focusing on. Sounds wild. It sounds wild. I know. So to that point, um, I'll be the one to kind of pull us back to executive functioning here. Um, so Traditionally, I've been one who connects self-discipline to inhibitory control, but what I'm learning in this conversation about the new science is that it's actually, um, you know, it may be the things that we do to give us back greater ability to utilize our executive functioning. So like that emotion. Yes. Control. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yep. That's exactly it. So it's, we think that it is self-control is so driven by executive functioning, um, inhibitory control. I absolutely would have said that too. Um, it is really what self-control is, is freedom. It is freedom from the internal conflict. And so that we can focus on kind of the work of building better habits, the work of learning when we're thinking about, well, all of us, but especially in like students, if they are focused on needing to sit still and they're like, they must behave in a certain way at a certain time, all the time, you are, what we are asking of them is to put all of their control, all of that capacity, that limited resource that could be going into cognitive like pursuits, we're putting that into our internal, like conflict of, okay, I'm supposed to sit still. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Oh, like, I don't want to, you know, wear the wrong thing. Oh, I wore that. Like they are dealing with so much internal conflict, breaking them out of that. The, the kid that you were speaking to, Jennifer, that shifted your paradigm, that kid had already came in with so much internal conflict in them, right? Um, or they might have also just been depleted in other ways. Um, so their capacity to sit in a way that we want them to and focus on goals we want them to focus on and learn in the ways we want them to, that is asking Herculean things of them. It is asking them to have mega minds. So really, it's about freeing up executive function, exactly as you said. So I know I've been dancing around it. I'm happy to talk about what it is that we can actually do to make us look like those people who we label as being self-disciplined. 
Yeah, let's do it. What is it? So this is where, you know, we talk about, in, there's some conflict about, you know, teaching emotions in a classroom. Like it doesn't, belong, like that's not my role. And understandably, like why you would think that, or like, why do I need to talk about social like situations, right? Like things like that. The reason why is because as we help a, so getting into practices here, as we help a student learn how to recognize and manage emotions, so recognizing being one of the first steps of regulating and managing their emotions, what we are doing is we're helping them to free up some of that internal conflict so that they can put it towards executive functioning, put it towards learning. So that's one of them is bringing that learning of emotions into the classroom. And we did a podcast on that. Um, so, and there's many resources available on learning how to bring in, you know, emotion regulation practices into the classroom. That's why it matters. So something that um, this conversation is making me think then that if uh, self-discipline is a finite resource or, um, you know, something that you don't have an infinite supply of, then finding ways in the classroom to make it so we can kind of uh, build their resources, replenish their resources would be important if discipline is, and I think it is, um, important to help kids get to their goals, right? So that's part of what we need to do well um, in school and work or whatever. So it seems like um, building in brain breaks when kids know when they're going to be able to get up, um, talk to their friends, have a snack, um, maybe even like posting it so kids can see what's coming will help them to kind of be able to manage, um, you know, or, or feel more um, like that bucket is being filled. Do you think that would work? I think that it it is possible. I think that um, I don't want to be too prescriptive about, um, you know, how to build in like their ability to express their, you know, their emotion or their I mean, part of emotions, like Dr. Mark Brackett talks about um, in his book, like there's not just the emotion itself and labeling the feeling that we turn in label as an emotion, right? Um, there's also the, what you're speaking to is kind of that physiological level of like, I am amped, I am ready, or I'm over, like I'm overly hyper, right? Or I am so bored. I'm so, and I think what I'm hearing in some of those brain breaks is like, that's kind of helping with their physiological um, arousal state. Um, so it could certainly help there. Um, there are a few others that are like these kind of core skills. And then there are, there's like this key classroom practice um, that you can build on in a lot of different ways. So do you mind if I just rapid fire these other kind of internal skills? Tell us. Okay. Okay. So we did regulate emotions and just like at the beginning, Emotions and managing stress, um, that is that is a critical one. I think coming, it feels like there is less ability to manage our stress. Um, and coming, you know, the years out of the pandemic, in the pandemic, like it feels like there's some misunderstandings about stress. I will just say this. We never want to think of it as eliminating all stressors. Instead, we want to help refocus attention inwardly, like help them to think through and manage the emotions of stress is a huge step forward. I know this is, I've got to move faster than this. It's this own episode. Um, so monitoring internal conflict in general. So this is a great way to um, provide a reflection exercise to them, um, helping them to learn different battles they are having in their brain. Um, and that can come up by you, you read a book and you apply what you hear the author, you know, applying their characters, like internal battles they're having, and then they can apply it to themselves. Or it can be more of a actual like direct learning on reflecting on those times that they have 
struggled or maybe there's something they're battling their heads about like why well, should you know the shoulds I should do this but I want to do this so that they become more aware of it because awareness is key to being able to manage that is key to life's happiness frankly um is awareness um but in the classroom so you can bring in some of these practices you can help them grow their awareness and I'm telling you, no matter what is happening at home or in the community, these practices will not only help their learning ability because it sets the brain up to learn. It gives students back more of their capacity to learn than to battle within themselves. Um, I'm thinking that routines are another way to kind of alleviate that inner conflict in the classroom. You know, I've seen um, routines be really successful because it helps students feel safe and feel like their environment's predictable and they don't always have that outside of the school environment. And, you know, I've seen some amazing teachers that have provided extra support to students that um, really struggle in this area with like visual aids to help them see what things are coming in their day and to be able to track their time in it really does alleviate some of that anxiety that they feel and um, helps them function better. And when you said it like frees up their brain space, I could totally see that it did that. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that one up. That is one of the key practices I was going to bring up. The routines, what that does so going back to what you were saying, it came about the brain ba- breaks. Like if that is built in as a routine and they know that it is, it allows them to do certain things, they can, if they get bored, if they start having this internal conflict of, I want to start moving, I want to start like, you know, messing with the person beside me. Like if they know that in five minutes I can stand up and I can like do things, like I can, whatever they do to explain what that's actually happening in their brain in that moment that helps them to resolve some of that internal conflict over what they want to do versus what they need to do because there is a part of executive function that is about inhibitory control of needing to sit still we all have it where sure I want to go skiing today but I'm you know like there as we go into being an adult this doesn't go away but there's less consistent conflict and willpowering our way through um, that gets in the way of our ability to function cognitively in other ways or being completely exhausted by the time we're done with school or work because we've worked so hard to like strong arm ourselves through being the right kind of person in a class or in a in a work setting so I love that you brought up routines um and I'll add this so What is a person who we see as disciplined? What is a person that really achieves that New Year's goal, right? The the small percentage of people who do it every year or the difference between those people and the people who think they can willpower their way to it is they remove themselves from the need for willpower by establishing habits. This could be its own episode too, but having habits, it removes its decisions already made. And so as you're adapting to those new decisions, finding ways to dopamine match, there's all sorts of, you know, like hacks on tie it to something exciting at the end. There are ways to hack it as you're building those behaviors. But over time, when it is not a decision anymore, it's not a conflict anymore. Over time, when the systems in your home and in your school support not needing to willpower a student through learning or willpower yourself to achieve a goal, you're far more likely to do it because you're working within the limitations of the brain to where the moment you look away and you don't have that willpower, the moment you come home after a long day and you're stressed, like willpower fails you and then you fail yourself you believe like it will fail every single time but a habit established and using that over time that is what changes things that is what a disciplined person is they have more habits 
that serve the life that they want. That is, that's the goal, right? That's the gold too. So that is the difference. It is the lack of willpower. Does that make, does that all add up? It's very liberating because it always feels like (laughs) deficient in willpower all the time. And now you're helping me see that things that are important need to become habits. And then that I wrote down what you said, when it's not a decision anymore, it's not a conflict anymore. And I think that's super powerful. Um, We're so glad you all joined us for this discussion about self-discipline in the education setting and beyond today. Um, Be sure to like and subscribe to the Change Starts Here podcast so you are alerted when our next episode drops. Thanks again. 